Good morning. Good morning and happy Monday. Beginning of another week. We are blessed and highly favored because God is our provider. God is fighting our battles and God has given us the opportunity to fellowship with him, to walk with him, to have an intimate relationship with him. And part of that relationship we'll be studying this week. And our title for this week's study is Prayer for Wisdom. So we're going to learn about praying for wisdom. And our example is King Solomon. King Solomon was asked what he was, what he desired most of all. We became king, and he said wisdom. I think that was a very smart thing to do. So before we start, let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you for another day, Father. Thank you for providing all that we need. Thank you for loving and caring for us. Thank you for being the one true creator of all that exists. Thank you for choosing us, Father. Thank you for blessing our lives, protecting us and our families. And thank you for encouraging us to seek a more intimate relationship with you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells in us, Father. And I thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross at Calvary and went to the grave and arose after three days and ascended on high and is seated at your right hand as your son and my savior. Thank you for Jesus, Father, and I pray in his name. Amen. Amen, okay. Prayer for wisdom. Okay, the central truth of this lesson is that God freely give wisdom to those who ask. And the focus is consider and emulate Solomon's desire for godly wisdom. Our evangelism emphasis is that Christians who witness to the loss are wise. Our golden text is from Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 and it reads, The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, let's let's read our introduction. Our introduction starts this way. This, our second lesson addressing the important prayers of the Bible, focuses on Solomon's encounter with God at Gilbreth as he begins his reign as king of Israel. See Second Corinthians chapter one verses one through thirteen. The conditions leading to the founding of Solomon's rule are detailed in the first two chapters of First Kings, providing pertinent information for this lesson. The Old Testament books are not always in chronological order. Therefore, it can be confusing to determine what Israel means. For example, originally it was the new name for Jacob. That's from Genesis 32, 28. In some contexts, it means the entirety of the Jewish people in their journey to establishing their own nation. <clears throat> See Genesis 35, 11. This is the context for this lesson. 
after Solomon's reign, division enters the kingdom and eventually 10 tribes pull away and are known as Israel, the Northern Kingdom, while the two remaining tribes are called Judah, the Southern Kingdom. The genesis of this disunion begins with Solomon's spiritual failures later in his life. In the beginning, Solomon wanted to reign, wanted his reign to be blessed of God. He witnessed God's work in the life of his father David during the good and bad times. He determined to consecrate his kingdom to God. And he does so through a royal extravagant offering unto God. If one can truly be extravagant in worshiping God. That night, God approached him and a conversation ensued that dramatically changed the remainder of his life. A review of Solomon's life quickly reveals God faithfully kept his promises to Solomon, although Solomon was not always as faithful in their spiritual relationship. If the wisest man on the faith of a face of the earth could get entangled and off course, then we understand our own need to walk uprightly, righteously, and circumspectly, cautiously, to use biblical language. Proverbs 28, 18, uh, Ephesians 5, 15. This requires sincere, humble prayer and study of the word. And further it, oh, it further requires that we learn and we learn to listen to what God is speaking and how it applies to our lives. When we have heard, we need to faithfully obey. God does not just go through the motions in our lives. We cannot afford for our relationship and prayers to become perfunctionary, designed to fulfill a sense of obligation or selfish wants. We must encounter the living God fresh every day in our lives. This requires effort, community commitment, determination, and intentional strategy, and a desire for biblical wisdom. Okay, we'll start section one, and it is titled, God Offers to Solomon. 1A is titled, Alliances and Sacrifices, from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. 1 Kings 3 and verse 3 reads, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibbon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Commentary reads, Upon solidifying his kingdom and power to reign, Solomon made an agreement with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
Pharaoh gave his daughter to Solomon to solidify the deal. Verse 1. Alliances were quite common in that age to assure peace between neighboring countries. The king of Egypt seemed to be as eager as Solomon to enter this alliance. Under David, Israel had become a reckoning force feared by the surrounding nations. At this point in history, Egypt was not the dominating power it had been in the past or the aggressor it would be in the future. This pharaoh is not Shishank, Shashank, who plundered Jerusalem and the temple. This alliance probably happened during the first year of Solomon's reign, though not necessarily at the very beginning. <clears throat> Specifically, this alliance provided protection for the southern part of Israel from an attack from or through Egypt and secured trade routes through Israel for Egypt. Solomon also received via his new wife the city of Gezer as a wedding present from Pharaoh. Creating mutually beneficial agreements with others is not necessarily a bad thing. However, in Solomon's case, they not only brought peace, they also brought distraction that led him away from God's commands and prescribed ways of worship. See 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 1 through 6. For this reason, we are cautioned to exercise extreme caution in our relationships, especially marriages that open the door for negatively affecting our relationship with God. Let's just see 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. The Ark of the Covenant was located in Jerusalem at this time, but was housed in David's tent. God did not allow David to construct the temple, despite his immense desire to do so. There are times in our lives when God allows us to prepare the way for another generation to fulfill our desires or visions, even when those desires are from God. We need to exercise discernment rather than force our plans. When there was no central proper place of worship, and even when there was, Israel tended to incorporate outside influences resulted in pagan corrupted worship. God foresaw this and prohibited Israel from doing so. Thus, they were to worship only in the places prescribed by him. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 1 through 14. Today, we are instructed to be the church and gather together for, for corporate worship. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 25. Solomon's, real, Solomon, Solomon's zeal for the Lord was fueled by his father's example. However, he also worshipped in certain places out of convenience. High places should not necessarily be understood here to refer to a pagan high place or altar 
to a false god, as it does in chapter 11, verse 7. The phrase can mean solitary place or a mountainous location. See Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 12 and 13. Gibbon was an important location. It was approximately six miles northwest of Jerusalem and was also the location of the tabernacle. See 1 Corinthians 16, verses 39 and 40, and verses 21 and 29. Or 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 29. There he offered a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4. In today's economy, this could easily be a multi-million dollar offering, depending on the unnamed animals sacrificed. Consequential Choices. This is an excerpt. And I'll read it. It says, in our postmodern world, the norm and expectation are for people to form their own spirituality based on their own worldview, apart from the church and what scripture says. A popular TV personality has confidently boasted that all roads lead to God and one spiritual relationship is not dependent on anyone else, especially organized religion, as opposed to unorganized religion, I guess. Sadly, she has deceived many and is leading them to eternal destruction. See John 14, 6, Acts 4 and 12. Our choices have consequences for ourselves and others. Amen. So, this lesson is about King Solomon and about his prayer for wisdom. And... The beginning of this lesson gives some background on Solomon's life um, and on his relationship with God. Uh, so tomorrow we'll continue with section 1B, which is titled A Commanding Question. And then section 2, where Solomon prays for wisdom. So until tomorrow, God bless you and keep you. His mercy shine down upon you and grace and peace fill your day. Take care.